The following interview was conducted with Robert W. Taylor, Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Economics for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, January 27, 2010, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good morning, Professor Taylor. Thank, Thank you very much. Glad to be Let's start here. off by telling us where and when you were born and your parents in the early years. <laughs> I was born on February 5th, 1935. That means my 75th birthday is next week. And uh, uh, I was in western New York on a farm. My mom and dad had both gone to college, which was pretty unusual. My father was a farmer. Uh, there were four boys in the family, and uh, uh, my oldest brother uh, farmed. Then um, uh, my two younger brothers, one a veterinarian, the other an ag economist, uh, just like me. And um, what kind of farm did your father have? Uh, he he had a farm that had grapes. Uh, there there are Concord grapes. These are the grapes that are used to make Welch grape juice products. Okay. And so he had a bunch of that. And then he was also he raised uh, Angus cattle, black Angus cattle. And so and we had uh, 25 enterprises on the farm, so we knew lots about lots of things. We raised cattle and, and hogs and sheep and chickens and uh, potatoes and grapes and lots of stuff. What did, did you sell? Were the grapes, did you sell to a winery they, or something they, to make them? They make all the wine? go to the Welsh Grape Juice Company. Okay. In fact, the Welsh Grape Juice Company is farmer-owned. And there's a contractual arrangement. You produce the grapes, and they go and they're sold to them. Oh, that's a that's a good product. That's a good that's product. Been, been around yeah. for a long time. Yes. <laughs> um, where did you go to grade school there, and then tell us about high school? Too. Well, I went to a one room school for six years, and that worked out reasonably well. I suppose the most interesting aspect of that is that there was no question but what I was the dumbest kid in my class. Uh, there were two girls in there who were just really shocked. But then when we went to the big school, uh, we discovered that we really weren't behind those other kids. And, uh, and so I went to Gowanda to high school, then uh, graduated, and they had a special program where they admitted kids from the farm, especially as we have some special admissions now. Sure. And so I got to go to Cornell. And, uh, Tell us a little about high school, how large the school was, and did you have any uh, the, clubs or There were 88 kids in our high school class. And um, yes, there were clubs, but but you remember, I came from a farm, and we and we it was worked close to hard on sure. the farm, right? And uh, they did elect me the president of the senior class, but that didn't amount to very much, and I really didn't do very much in high school, other than uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, I almost flunked typing because with our working on the farm, my hands were so stiff, I couldn't do that. Once I got away, the typing skills were fine, but pitching was bad for typing. <laughs> uh, how did you happen to select Cornell? My father had gone to Cornell, okay. and it just seemed like a good place to go. All right. Well, tell us about campus life, and did you live on campus? I lived uh, on campus. We lived in a cooperative house, and that worked out really well for us. Uh, our cooperative house was right next to a big dormitory, and the dormitory didn't have food service. And so this co-op house had decided that they would open their kitchen to outsiders. And so we served the 35 people that lived in the house and probably about 100 more. Uh, and then we contracted with the rowing club for the, the crew, and we fed them a special training meal. And so this meant lots and lots of work in the kitchen. So the usual thing was that when we did our house bills at the end of the month, they owed me money rather than me owe them, and that worked good. <laughs> that um, sounds like a good deal. <laughs> yes, my mother had taught us to cook, and they paid cooks better than they did dishwashers, so that helped also. Do you have a favorite recipe that you used to like to do? Do you still do it? I don't do very much of that because my wife is so good but you can help them. I could. You had a previous experience. <laughs> you bet. All right. Were there any athletics that you uh, participated in while you were in high school? No, oh. I didn't do any right. of that kind um, of stuff. What, what about professors? What, what was your major in college? In college, I majored in extension, uh, which means uh, being a county extension agent or extension educator, and he's the link between the county and the university. Uh, and uh, the idea would be that if a farmer had a problem, he would call the extension agent or educator and ask him, and then the county 
educator is supposed to know who at the university would be able to help. And so I was a go-between there. Sure. But frankly, I found that I, I had this bias that if I was any good, I would know the answers to those questions. Well, I didn't, and that really frustrated me. So I decided then, um, it, I took that job as an extension agent. After you, is this after, after you graduated? graduated? Okay. I knew that's what I wanted to do, and then I found that very frustrating. So then I decided I would go to graduate school and, and narrow my focus. And I didn't take many ag economics classes as an undergraduate because I didn't think that was very interesting. But I found the, the extension people that I dealt with as an extension educator uh, uh, were fascinating. And so that's where I decided to put my emphasis in grad school. And I, and I came here, of course, to do grad How did you happen to select Purdue? And you, this was different from coming from Upper New York State. I, I went to Cornell and asked the professors there what was a good place to go. And they told me that if I went to Iowa State, they were too theoretical. But that Purdue had just the right combination of theory and practice. I had never heard of Purdue University. I asked my father if about Purdue. He said that's the best school in the country because it has supplement A, which was a feed, a, a protein supplement that you fed the cattle. And when my father had fed that to his cattle, the cattle did much better. And so he told me to go to Purdue. And that's what I did. Did you come beforehand and to visit and check it out? No, nope, just came. And, and the interesting feature of that was that I decided I would go to uh, Purdue in the Ag Economics Department, and I wrote a letter to head Department of Agricultural Economics, Purdue West Lafayette. Within a, a, a 10 days, I got a two or three page letter back saying, we are really excited that you are coming to Purdue to do graduate work. and. Uh, it doesn't cost, it pays, we will give you an assistantship. And if you will fill out this application that will facilitate things, which was pretty surprising. Pretty good, and that's right. what I discovered, if things were different then, but that was Lowell Harden, my guess is you know who Lowell Harden is. And Lowell Harden's uncle knew my aunt. And somehow that connection was made. And that's what got me admitted Super. to Peru. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you came, what, were, what about you? Were, were you married at the time? I was. Oh, we okay. had been married about a year. Huh? Where, did you meet your wife at Cornell? Uh, yes. Okay. And now she went to Buffalo State. But uh, it was through. We worked in the summer in extension together. And that's okay. how I met her. Okay. And then we were married right after I graduated. I worked for a year and then came here. Okay. Where did you, what was, like, uh, what was your impression when you first came? What about finding housing? Well, getting acclimated uh, in the fifties, late fifties. We had yeah, fifty-seven. We had made an arrangement to get an uh, Purdue apartment. It was called an efficiency, which sounded like a really good idea to me until I saw it, and then, uh, then basically what we did was we bought a, a ten-foot wide mobile home and lived there, had our kids. <laughs> Where was it located? It was on uh, 52 North. In fact, it was called the 52 in uh, Trailer Park, and we lived there, well, basically until I was on the faculty. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then, but then you, you, you stayed on for your PhD. I, uh, yes, I got my master's and then stayed for a PhD. Okay. And, uh, uh, and then uh, I got an opportunity. Uh, I was a little, we had three kids at that point. And um, uh, I got an opportunity to teach at Vincennes. Purdue provides professors for Vincennes University's Ag School classes. And so they asked me if I would go and do that. And, and it looked like a good way of making some money. It never passed my mind I might enjoy it. And I found that I really enjoyed the classroom. And so then, then I came back. That was well, did you live on, did, did you live on campus there? No, or? no. Uh, what sort of an arrangement? That's interesting. The, the arrangement was that I went down and and I taught. Uh, I taught two classes, and I taught them in the afternoon. I'm going to say I taught them in Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning, and then came home. So it was a business of going down and and teaching those classes, and then coming back. 
Did they have much in the area of agriculture there at that time? Or I had pretty good classes. It seems to me that there were 25 or 40 in each one of them, okay. so there were two classes. Right. And uh, they were good students. They were fun. I had a really old guy in the class. He had to be 35. Scared the dickens out of me. <laughs> Are they still doing that? Do they still yes. have that arrangement? That's interesting. Still do that. Well, tell us a little about uh, Ag the department and your initial appointment and your teaching or mac macroeconomics well, and farm management. After that Vincennes experience, when I came back, then the, the Ag Economics Department asked me if I would teach the freshman class, which was a class I taught at Vincennes. And because the professor was going on sabbatic leave and I agreed to do that. That sounded like just what I'd like to do. So I taught that in 62 along with the economics class that I'm still teaching. So I started in 62 with that. Wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and then and I taught those two classes through um, uh, the, the uh, 60s. And then in 70, I took a sabbatic leave and went to Washington and worked in the Foreign Economic Development Division there uh, and worked primarily with, with helping find the right universities for foreign students to go to and then some in developing some research programs. And that was a fun thing. It was a fun thing for a family to do. It's a, that's an exciting place to go. Mm -hmm. to lots going on there. Yeah, lots going yeah. on there. Yeah. A lot of cultural activities, you too. Bet. So, uh, and then came back. And uh, frankly, I had been offered the opportunity to go to Brazil, but when I brought that up with my family, I'm going to say in 57 or 58 or 59, uh, 67, 68, 69, uh, they were not enthused about going. So I decided then that we would go to Washington. But after that, and it was such a great experience for them, the next time I got an opportunity to go to Brazil, the family said, let's go! When, so when we were you went. down there? And tell us a little about, uh, about the project for the researchers. Well, the, I was down there in 72 and 73, and that was kind of the end of, I'm going to say, a 15-year project. But it was a long time. Yeah, started what, sometime in the 60s, I imagine. Yes. Okay. And, and what happened was that, uh, I think it started in the 50s. Oh, okay, um, okay. Uh, I think that the first people that went down there, we were assigned to this small university in, in the state of Minas Gerais, and it was called Visaza, and um, it, th this was in a very, very poor area. It was an area where they had gone in and cleaned the, the forest away and planted coffee in the 20s. And then when the 30s and the Depression came, the coffee market went bad, and then when World War II came, it got worse. And so then they had decided that the only way to save the coffee market was to reduce output so that there would be higher prices. And so they went in and eradicated all that coffee. And then uh, decided that what they better do with that eradicated coffee land was to put cattle on it, so just run cattle on the pastures. Well, it doesn't take many people to take care of cattle, and, and there were an awful lot of people on there, an awful lot of handwork with coffee. So there were many, many people with almost nothing to do, and so that's why it was so terribly poor, and that's why we were asked to go there. And the first thing that, that the Purdue people discovered was that, that, the, uh, that the, the word, there wasn't a very good system for the university to help farmers with ideas, so they started an extension service. An extension service, of course, had to do with taking those good ideas from the university out to farmers. And the first ideas were remarkably simple. The idea that instead of just planting all your crops in the same field, you better have one part for corn and one part for beans and one part for cassava. And, and the second idea that they used was you ought to plant those in rows. If you plant them in rows, your weed control is easier. You can get in there and harvest them, all that kind of simple ideas. But it didn't take them any time to discover that, that they had exhausted the new good ideas that was coming out of the, or coming out of the, it, the research station. And so they began to look and say, what's the matter with these guys? Why aren't they coming up with better ideas? And the answer is that it seems to me that there were 500 researchers in Brazil at that time, and only two of them had a master's degree. And you know, 
we don't train people to do research in a bachelor's program. Sure, sure. And so it wasn't reasonable to expect those guys to be very efficient and productive. But what they did then was to start a major, massive master's program in several there. universities, and certainly the Saza was one of them. And so we had a booming master's program. I can't remember how big it was, but we had lots of kids there, lots of people there. And, uh, and that was remarkably effective. Those people got their master's degrees and then went and did a variety of things that were just remarkably effective at did, it. Excuse me, did any of them come here to do a master's or was it all done down there? Was there any kind of exchange? Yeah, they started, of course, by people okay. coming here okay. and then going back and they taught the masters there at the Saza. Okay. Well, then what they discovered was that they needed more professors in order to teach more master students. So that was the thing that was the bind. And the standard business was to take one of those outstanding students in the master's program, identify him as a potential professor, and then uh, decide he was going to go to France or to the uh, US or England to study, and many of them to US, of course. And so the first thing they had to do was to learn English, and it would take them at least a year to get to where their English skills were good enough that they could go to school. And then they uh, sent them to Purdue or wherever, and it took them about six months of acculturation to get to where they could be effective there, and then the three or four years to get their PhD. And then there was another six months of acculturation when they got back because things at home weren't like where they were here. And they decided that one way of increasing that efficiency of that program was to offer a PhD in Brazil at Bissosa. And that's where I came in. I went there to help get that PhD program started. And so I was on every committee and uh, and I taught marketing and farm management in the classes there in Portuguese. And the language uh, of instruction was Portuguese? You bet. Uh -huh. Did you, had you know it before you went to Not down? a word. And okay. so that was a, the, oh. the deal was that that was my first job. For the first three months, I went to the language instructor from 8 to 10 every day. Down there? She, yes, and she gave me about eight hours of homework. Next morning, 8 to 10. She and I together. She was an excellent teacher. Boy, that's I can intensive. Remember the day that she told me that we have go went and gone, and there's another kind of verb down there. And the day she told me that, the tears ran down my face. I couldn't take that. But but after three months, um, I, I could get around and I could talk to people and. Of course, lecturing is way easier than doing anything else because you talk about what you want to talk about. You talk about what you know. If you don't know, you don't talk about it. It was the questions that got you. They had to ask a question. I didn't know that word. I didn't know if it was a town or a man or a disease or a crop. Uh, and there was a lot of laughing going on. And those guys were very kind. They had taken English much as our grade school kids have taken Spanish, and so they knew some words, and they'd go up and write the word on a board sometimes, and they couldn't get it. The, in Portuguese, if you know how to spell a word, you know how to pronounce it. The letters are pronounced the same, every word. Well, that's not true in English. And they thought English pronunciation was terrible. Others have said, the, over the years, have said the same thing. I just... Have a problem. So that what we if what we found is if 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 we were talking to somebody and we just could not understand, it was almost always that they were trying to speak English with a pronunciation that was impossible. <laughs> so, but I taught those classes. I was on all those committees. Did your family accompany you down there? Oh yes, and that was one of the best things for them. They all learned the language. Um, Did they go to an English school or a Portuguese? We heard that kids would learn the language very quickly, and they did. But And so we made the mistake of sending them right to the Portuguese school, the Brazilian school. At, In at the, the town beginning. there? With yes. And that did not work well because the teacher would say, okay, kids, now take care of your pen, paper, books and stuff and get out a pencil and paper. We're going to have a spelling test. Well, guess what? My kids didn't take care of their stuff. They didn't get out a pencil. They didn't have the foggiest notion what those words meant. 
and the teacher was not accustomed to dealing with people who didn't know the language, so she thought they were being naughty, and uh, that didn't work very well. <laughs> now, our, uh, our youngest was in kindergarten, and that worked fine. Well, I don't know just why, but that worked fine. Yeah. And, and, but the other ones then, we did, uh, we had home study courses, and we got a teacher that helped us with that. Did you do any traveling? Uh, did they provide housing down there for they you? They provided housing for us, and then I had a car, and we did a lot of traveling. And uh, that was wonderful. The best single part of it was being able to go and visit with those farmers uh, and to be able to talk to them. And interact with them, which yes. is really nice. Uh, yes. I remember I was interested in the soapstone dishes that they made. There was a town that made soapstone dishes that was really off the beaten track, and the only time you could get there was about one month during the dry season. And so I went back in there, and it was fun to see those guys. And the water was coming off the side of the mountain, and they had a lathe, and they were making the dishes. And we picked out some that we wanted to have. And, and uh, what we ended up with was about six pots and about five covers. He didn't have a cover for one of them. And he said, but I'll make it for you right now. And I said, well, I'll just come watch. And so the rest of them stayed. And he and I went back to where we were, and he put that uh, rock on the lathe and started to turn it. And then he said, I want to ask you a personal question. And I said, okay. He said, why is it that you insist that your children speak the way they do? I didn't know why, what this was about. And then all of a sudden it came to me. He had never heard a person speak with an accent. And this guy was a diplomat. He wanted to know about my children. Well, guess who had the big bad accent? <laughs> but, uh, so it was interesting to yeah. visit with people who had never seen or talked to a foreigner before. And that just happened lots of times. That's it was fun very to do. Yeah. yeah, did you uh, were you down there? What two years? Two years. Uh, did you come back in the meantime during the no, or not? No, you no, stayed no, down there for the whole two years. Down there for two okay. Years. Then after you came back, did you go back to the department or? I went right back to the department, okay. and uh, and uh, the, I had plenty to do. I got back in the teaching business, and and that's when I started doing some extension work, and so I let the research go. That's that I just I've done some of that before, but extension and teaching work what I went. My t extension area was in the area of father-son farm business management, and so that's where I put my emphasis, and that's where I still put that's my great. emphasis. And you do a lot of advising, and you've been a faculty advisor, too, to the students and also uh, yes, the Yes, in, in the School of Agriculture, the faculty advised the students, and uh, I did that in a big way. I enjoyed doing that, and you, you'd get them when they'd come, you know, thinking about going to Purdue, and then, of course, all the time while they're here, and then afterwards when they get out. This and having them fun. into your home, too? You bet. That's uh, right. That's fun. Uh, talk a little about your Portugal appointment at Villarreal. And when well, was that? what happened with that was that they needed somebody to teach farm management who spoke Portuguese. And um, I hadn't done hardly any international work. It to take some foreign students around that came. But that was an opportunity for six weeks. And so I went there and basically taught applied farm management to the faculty at this university. Now, the people who were on the faculty all, all came from the city and did passing, but not spectacularly, on their university admissions tests. And so they got their last choice, which was agriculture. And they didn't know much about the practical end of, of farming, and that was my hope. And one of the things that I did was I insisted that we go out and make farm visits and talk to, to the farmers. To the farmers, and, right. Sure. And uh, that, that was really new and different for them because when we'd, when we'd get on the farm, you know, they'd ask me which one is the bull, which is the cow. Uh, they didn't have any clue. And, uh, and that was kind of fun. Did they, were they going to be professors? Is they were already professors. Oh. They were already teaching farm management. Can you guess that there was a little breakdown in there some? <laughs> kind of. Yep. So that was fun to do. Yeah. 
and the language of instruction was also in Portuguese there. So that was that, and yep. and you lived right on campus, or uh, we lived it, in a hotel. Was it a very but it was, large? No, it was school? a tiny town. Okay. We lived on one side of town. The university was on the other side of town. It was easy to walk across. <laughs> Oh, oh, talk about uh, so advising some of the students that one on one. Do you keep in touch? Uh, let's all see. All through time, um, the the students came, and of course, uh, you know the, the mechanics they needed to come and and to get courses for the next semester. But in the process of doing that, I could ask them what what they wanted to do with their lives, and then think about what courses would help them get there. Right. And. Um, and the big thing you notice with that at the beginning, they want to know what's the easiest courses that they could get by with. But by the time they get to be seniors, they want to know, my goodness, I need to know some accounting, I need to know it. And so it was fun to see them come alive and realize that there were some subject through the, matter. Through the there. cycle there. I could help them with yeah, that. Right. And, and then help them with employment. We don't do that as much now because of the Center for Career Opportunities, which does an excellent job. But, uh, but we used to help with that. And then, uh, well, now, goodness sakes, one of my majors um, uh, that I advised came to class week before last. He was in my class in 1963, and he came and visited me. And, uh, What's he doing the, now? Uh, well, he's retired. He worked for Procter & Gamble for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, and he dropped it, isn't that he nice? He came with his wife and uh, saw That's it great, that is nice. Yep. So it reminds me when, uh, our, when uh, Orville Redenbacher used to come on campus, you know, and uh, people would see him and they'd come up and he always had this little card and he'd give the card and he'd say, yes indeed, you did see Orville Redenbacher. <laughs> Good. Oh, how about advisor to, to, tell us about advising the Farm Management Club and also the Boilermaker Tractor. Well, let's start with the tractor pull. Yeah. Uh, the, For I, research uh, stones, the we'll tractor that. pull. The idea with the tractor pull, uh, when that got started, and let's see, that was back in the, in the early 70s, okay. it, r right when we came back from Brazil. And the idea was that you would take an old tractor and soup it up, and then you'd go and pull in competition with your neighbors. And it seemed to me that it would be a great idea for the kids in the Alpha Gamma Road to have a tractor and the kids in, in Farmhouse to have a tractor and 14 other groups and they'd have a contest. And so it just seemed like a great idea. And that's why we started it. And that's, uh, but it, it, it evolved in surprising ways. It was in um, the fall it was held, right? In yes, we held it in the fall. And, um, and we held it for not only for Purdue, people, but f just for everybody that wanted to pull tractors. Well, it turned out that that changed so quickly that no Purdue group ever could afford a tractor. Uh, uh, the, and so the people who pulled, well, I remember that just one engine would cost $25,000, and, and some of them had three or four engines on them. And so it just became prohibitively expensive. So that now we were running a tractor pull primarily from the idea of leadership in running an organization. But the problem with it was that it was terribly expensive. And uh, if everything worked beautifully, we could break even plus a little bit. And you didn't have to have very many bad things go wrong. And, uh, and, and you could lose a lot of money. And, and uh, so we ran the tractor pull, I'm going to say, from, from 74 to 88 or 89. And, uh, and that, uh, that was the end of that, just because the finances were so bad. Where about, for the research, where was that held? In the field, uh, Let, okay. Let's see. Uh, it, was, it was held on a field right in uh, one of the animal science fields right near the airport. If you... Um, it, it, it's not easy so to get there. So it's close to campus. Yeah, close to campus. Right. Okay. And it was a wonderful opportunity for for teaching leadership. Right. But uh, the idea of the tractor pull didn't come out the way we thought it would. Right. That's all. Yeah. But it was a good thing. Sure. Right. Farm Management Club. Yeah. Um, you, you still are you still involved with the club as uh, an advisor? No. No. I'm still. Uh, let's see. I am not now an advisor of the. Uh, farm management club. They usually ask me to come speak every semester, but um, but we set that up, and I'm gonna say we set that up in the eighty nineties. We set that up in the nineties, and uh, and um, 
that was a vibrant outfit and it's still going strong. Um, we decided to, to just have meetings that bring in bankers and bring in professional farm managers and all that kind of stuff. I suppose the, the most interesting aspect of that was the officer team came in one uh, fall and said that they thought maybe they ought to have a field trip and they were thinking about going to the Board of Trade in Chicago. And I said, well, we can certainly do that. Is that where you really want to go? And they said, no, we really want to go to Brazil, but we can't do that. And I said, well, I don't see any reason not to. And that next spring, we went to Brazil. It was the first international trip by any Purdue student organization. There were about 15 of us. <coughs> um, we went to Brazil. Uh, we saw the expanding areas down there. It was a wonderful Experience. Did you go to the Minas Gratis to uh, Viscosa? We did not go to So you went Viscosa. to Rio? Or? Well, we went to the Mato Grosso, which was the new land. You know, there's very little new farmland in the world. This was land that was just wasteland. They got a lot of rain. Uh, I think they got about 80 inches of rain. We only get 40, so they got more rain than we get. But nothing grew there. Uh, there were scrub trees, but somebody discovered that if they fertilized it and if they treated it right, they could raise wonderful crops. And so this was a giant area where they went in and ex uh, cleared that land and planted the corn and soybeans. And uh, this is one of the very few areas where um, they're opening up new land to crop. And that's what we went to visit. Sure. And it's kind of interesting to think about. You know, there were no roads. There was no electricity. There were no telephones. There was nothing. There were no towns. It was just a, just a, big, a big blank area. But, and, but the soil, when properly managed, uh, could be very, very productive. And it was fun to go and see that. Oh, it was great for the students. Oh, right. yeah, we had a good time. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, how about the department? That's, has that grown over time, Aggie Con, you say? Let's see, the Aggie Con department, um, <laughs> maybe I should have looked those numbers up. I would say it is not a lot bigger now than it has been. It, okay. it just hasn't grown a lot. Now, it grew and then it shrunk. Um, we had some real budget problems with research, and there was a period of time when we lost a researcher a year for eight years in a row, and that was not much fun. Yeah, yeah. Now that has stopped now, uh, but the size of the department hasn't grown right. very much. We've always been a good, big department. When you came, was the Craner Building built? Were you in the Craner no. Building? Oh, uh, when I came, okay. we were in where the Forestry Department is now. Oh, okay. And, um, and, and we were there, I came in 57, we were there, they put the Craner Building up in 65. Okay. And okay. so I remember I forgot. And of course that. you knew John Halkus, the oh, librarian. Sure. Sure, John. John was a good colleague. Yes. Yeah, right. Uh, so, uh, but uh, when I think about the Ag Economics Department and I think about, um, you know, its evolution, uh, the, the key thing is that we have had some fabulous leaders. Uh, we just had a string of outstanding department heads. Not all, but almost all since right. uh, in this 50 years that I've been here. Uh, and right now we've got a, just a great and at the same time, we've had wonderful deans, that we've had good management and uh, supportive faculty that, and, and, and supportive administration. If you don't have good administration, it's hard. Uh, and we've had wonderful administration, both at the school and at the department. Yeah, that's very good. And that's yep, really yeah. key. That's right. Yes. <laughs> right. Without that, it's hard to make it. <laughs> Let's talk about some of your awards. I think the worst one was that. We've got the Richard Cole's Outstanding Undergrad Teaching Award. That was 1976. That's pretty good in uh, those early years. Yes. Now, he was a professor. And he was, there. He was the dean at that time. He was the dean, and he provided that. Uh -huh. Well, the first one was in 70, both the School of Agriculture and the, the um, American Ag Economics Association gave me a teaching award in 70, which was pretty nice because I'd only been teaching since, well, 61 to 70. That was pretty nifty. It's, lot, it's awesome. Yeah, and you got the uh, the Amico, and you're also in the Purdue of, of great the Book of Great Teachers. Yes, they've been very kind to me in lots and lots of ways. 
I've enjoyed uh, that recognition. Uh, the Hub, how did you find out about the Hubby Award? That's kind of neat. That's a really special thing. The Hubby Award is given by the Farm Bureau, and um, uh, they called me and, and invited me to come uh, and, and receive that award. The thing I remember is that we recognized this was a pretty big deal. And so we invited our kids all to come, and they did. And we went down there, and that afternoon, I came down with a flu like you couldn't believe. It'd it be was day of you. hard for me to make it up on the platform, <laughs> but I, I managed. I, I, I did it. <laughs> right. So uh, when I think about that Humpty Award, that's what I think about. That's the day I had the flu terribly. Uh, <laughs> I know the Special Boilermaker Award, the Alumni Association oh, gave that was it. Pretty neat. Yeah, and they give that at, at uh, the football. Okay, yes, uh, time. Uh, right. yeah. and so okay. I now, probably saw you because I go to all the games. <laughs> Yeah. They, they, there were uh, three of us that got that award this year. Uh, one was the, the head of the police department who was just retiring, and I should be able to say his name, but I can't. Then we went out on the field, and they gave us the award, and they gave us this, this, this wooden base with a pewter uh, train on it as our uh, uh, award. And now the program is done. The half time is over. It's ready to leave. And so I just followed the police chief right out there, and he went and put his uh, thing in his car and then turned to go back and to go in. Well, at the police chief, he could get in anywhere at any time. But I didn't have a place to put that, and when I tried to come back in with that award, the guy wouldn't let me in. That was a dangerous weapon. And he said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> and finally, he said, just turned his back. He didn't say go in, but I got the message. <laughs> so I walked in with my dangerous weapon. <laughs> oh, that was we got a couple of others that are kind of the um, the agricultural alumni. Their certificate of distinction. That's, that's very. Pretty that's very that's nice. pretty neat. That's Did you know a little bit in advance, or how? Uh, a little? Was bit, that, no. they, is that? They give that at the ag alumni uh, fish fry. Is that right, when it's given? Uh, okay. Yes. Now, it, you could just guess I have been involved with the Ag Alumni sure. since the beginning, and I was a president of that for a while, and, uh, uh, and so uh, I, I understood that, and that was pretty nice that they did that. But that was basically after all the, after I had retired from that. Um, the Ag Alumni, the Eric Fish Fry has really changed over time. Remember, <laughs> remember used to be here, uh, and I've seen pictures. It was in the middle pictures. of that, <laughs> yes. They yeah. ran in the armory for a long time. Wild business. It's changed a lot. Yes. Format. Did you get to go to it when it was? I in the wanted to go. I never have, and I wanted to. I missed in the well, early years. Well, of course, there's a reason for that. At first, we wouldn't let any women go. Oh. We were so raunchy that we didn't want to embarrass anybody. When did that that must have started well, years ago, before I came. I came oh. in '68. I was a girl. Yes, it was then. going strong by then. Uh, now it was young then. But that uh, that was a wild <laughs> business, and uh, and and then they about two thousand. Oh, staff. just. Uh, but about two thousand, we decided that that the tenor the twenty first century has changed, moving. and so then uh, uh, we changed it, and we brought in we brought in Norm Borlaug to talk to them, and uh, and, and some oh, outstanding uh, speakers, and and just made it a serious event instead of this. Wild thing. And didn't they used to have the uh, the lectures that day? And then often I think the fish fry would be maybe on a Saturday. And yes, then the it day was. Before was a lot of, of lectures and talks to the people that were. We had a whole week. A week. That's what that. it was, right? And then the fish fry was on Friday. That's right. Now okay. we we do that. The whole week thing is just summarized in the morning before sure. the fish fry. Right. And you always had a good attendance. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then the other thing that I recall too it brings up a point. Remember these type of winter courses? Yes. That would run those? I was they, involved with that. They don't have those anymore. We don't have that anymore. No. That, Why the winter courses were designed for people who so wanted to farm but didn't want to waste four years going to school. Okay. Those kids knew that going to college was solid partying. And they didn't want to party for four years. They thought eight weeks would be about right. So they would come ready to do this wild party 
Well, in the winter course, we gave those guys the equivalent of 24 credit hours worth of material, and we gave them a lot of homework, and we gave them a lot of quizzes, and we worked their butts off. And those guys, those guys made a giant transformation. They came knowing that math was an invention of the devil for harassing uh, students and ended up realizing, you know, you do have to make some calculations. And, and they came thinking that education was a useful, useless idea and left saying, my goodness, there's a lot to learn. And one of the interesting things about that, five years after graduation from the winter course, you couldn't tell a winter course graduate from a four-year graduate. Uh, those guys left here with an attitude that said, my goodness, there's a lot I need to learn. And you can't beat that attitude. And so that winter course was a wonderful success. What happened was that the number of people who who were starting farming just got so small that this program got so small that it was uneconomic. About approximately how many years was that run? Did that start in the 50s? It ran for 100 years. Oh, it ran for 100 so years, on. and I'm going to say 87 was, a, it could have been 1887 to 1987 okay. or something like that. Yeah. It ran a and long what, time. For, was it for eight weeks? So they were here for eight, eight weeks. Eight. They were here for the first eight weeks of the of the January semester. January and February, yeah, that's right. Okay, don't. And then another one, you're an honorary old master. And uh, this is a new one for 2009, the second best teacher. How about that? Expo. How about that? <laughs> That's How did, were you surprised about that one? Well, of course, I was amazed Good. about that. Sure. That was I said, my well, gosh. You know, <laughs> I had no idea. I don't know how scientific their <laughs> <laughs> analysis is, but I'm well, glad to, well, I'm glad to take it. You know, I'll yeah, take it sure, and run take it. it. And on your, the International Association of Ag, uh, Agricultural Economics, you still belong to that? Well, uh, the facts of the matter are that I have dropped that membership. I was deeply involved with that in the teaching part for years, but then I've just let that go. Right. As I get older, I do some things, and there are a whole lot more things I can't do anymore. <laughs> That's one of them. Now we're talking about retirement activities. You'll continue to teach. That's the amazing part. Are you um, teaching both semesters? I'm teaching both semesters, and I have, uh, I have a few over 500 students this semester, and um, I teach. <coughs> let's see, in the fall, I teach. Uh, I teach a class for kids that are on academic probation. These guys are just about ready to flunk out, and there's usually eight or ten of them. And they come and work with. Is them. it just an ag or another it's department? Just, it's just from ag economics, and these guys are on probation. And my deal with them, I tell them that if they will come, if they will do the homework, do what I ask them to do, and tell me the truth, uh, and and respond positively to my suggestions, that I will guarantee them they won't flunk out. Well, they don't see how this is possible. But the idea is if they aren't here and aren't doing well by the middle of the semester, they've got to drop out of the university. But the success rate with that has been unbelievable. I think I've had somewhere around 140 of those kids that I've had. And there are two that have flunked out. So, and, and you know, usually that's a whole lot more than that. And uh, the, that's very nice. the thing And you that, really get to small groups, you oh, really sure. get to know them and work with them. The main thing that I do is I have them uh, uh, figure out analytically and uh, with a hard pencil uh, just how am I doing in every class every week. You know, uh, what percent of the homework did I turn in? What percent did I understand? What, what percent of the lectures did I go to? What percent of the reading did I do? And they've just got to go around through and tell me what they did in every single class. And of course, they've never done that before. And the other thing is then to keep track of exactly what their grades are. That And the standard business, when you ask those kids um, uh, what their grades are, their answer basically is, if I get A's in everything from here on, then I'll get a B. Well, that's not going to happen. You know, it ought to be a weighted average of the scores that they have taken. And so that is a new approach for them. But the most important thing, I think, is they are somewhat amazed that a professor would be interested in obvious losers like them. And, um, 
and they are amazed that that we recognize that the problem is not always with the student. We have classes that are not very well taught and that that just just often destroy kids. And um, and, and they and tend to give up. Yes. Should. Yes. And I thought they didn't know how to study. They know how to study. They just don't do it. Um, and so by helping to do that. So that, I, I teach that class, uh, and I have a good time with that. And then I teach my farm management class, and the farm management class uh, has about 120 kids in it a year, and I teach it twice, so it's somewhere around, I don't know why, but it's at 40 and 90 is where it is now. Uh, uh, I have about 90 kids in the class in the spring and about 45, 50 in the fall. And, uh, and then the economics class, macroeconomics, I have two big classes of that. This semester I have 270 and 170 in those two classes. So that's a lot of entertainment. And then in the spring I don't teach the probation class, and I did, instead I teach the class to grad students on how to teach. And basically yes, these are just it. tricks that I've learned. For example, you ought to have a seating chart. And they think that's pretty kindergartenish, but uh, but that seating chart is important for lots of reasons. And for example, one of them is if if you don't have them in a seating chart, you have no way of knowing what name goes with what face. And so, with a seating chart, you got that. It makes it easy to hand papers back because you can just hand them back and, and they go back. Um, sometimes people sit together for bad reasons. And if you have a seating chart, it avoids that problem. Um, I said a boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. I just will have biology on my side. Um, and in the farm management class, I accept them where the kid with the farm sits by the kid without the farm. So, uh, a whole semester for that <laughs> stuff. So um, that's why. Yeah, that's but other, uh, talk a little bit about your uh, special hobby, your woodworking. Ah, well, I, I have, uh, I was a shop major in high school, so I learned a little about that, and I've done that, and, and uh, mostly it has to do with home improvement and that kind of stuff, but I have made this commitment to make a grandfather clock for each of my grandchildren. I have 11 grandchildren, I've got eight grandfather clocks that are ticking, and I've got three more that are coming, and they're about three quarters done. But uh, that's very they're nice. common. So let's talk about family. Do you, how many? Do you have three children. I have four children. Okay. And our oldest is Bill. He's in California. Uh, his uh, his boys. Uh, his oldest boy is in medical school at Ohio State, and his youngest boy is a senior in ag economics at Ohio State. And then the second. Wait, lives in California. Now, oh. Bill lives in California. Okay. Okay. Our son is oh. a grandchildren at okay. Ohio State. <clears throat> uh, then uh, our next is Cindy, and she works in the, uh, in the uh, environmental center here at Purdue. And she lives up here, and she has chickens and lives in the country and has a good time. And then our next is Susan, and Susan is in Wyoming, and she has four children, and that's where we got into the great-grandchildren business. So I got two great-grandboys, and their birthday, one of their birthdays is next week, and the next one is they've got to wait up six weeks uh, to get there. Well, it's close there. to yours. Yes. That's kind of nice. Uh, and then our youngest is Dan, and Dan is in the Ag and Biological Engineering Department, and he has five children. Here at Purdue. Oh. And they're out at Rossville. That's, uh, they're remodeling their house, and that's where I get a chance to do wiring and plumbing and Stiff framing and yeah. all kinds of stuff. Oh, good stuff. How about, uh, do you have an outstanding event? in your life comes to mind? Would you like to share with us? I suppose that uh, in this, uh, there is a family uh, summer cottage on Lake Erie uh, where the family meets. It's a great magnet for grandchildren. They all want to come and be water ski and do all kinds of things. I suppose that's a, that's a great Where about is it located? It's near Niagara Falls. It's oh, on okay. Lake Erie. Okay. So nice. that's that's a fun thing yeah. to do. And you still have it? You go there every summer? We have it. We do it every summer. And someday when I retire, uh, I'll stay there even more. But uh, when I think about the amazing thing, it's amazing that I've been able to teach for 49 years here. Isn't that wonderful? 
Uh, 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 put, put the ball in your court. It was in looking back and looking ahead in your own words, or to summarize it. Go ahead. Well, uh, I have enjoyed working with the students, and uh, I decided that I would continue as long as the course evaluations are good. They are good. Uh, and so I'm just having a good time teaching those kids. And of course, this is a pretty exciting time to teach macroeconomics with all the commotion that's going on. Right, right. So, and it's an exciting time to teach farm management. So I have a good time with that. I worry a little about, about taking those classes away from someone else who wants to teach them. But I keep asking that question, and uh, I still do it. And I've signed up to do it next year, so I'll make 50 years in the classroom at Purdue. That's pretty That's pretty When good. did you retire, actually? When? Well, the, the, did they have the official for you? No. Oh. The official one was in 2005. Oh, okay. And they didn't do another special for you? But you well, I was continuing oh. right along. Oh. You know, that yeah, but you can have two retirement it's, parties. It's only you with the <laughs> department head that knows that I'm retired. <laughs> Well, my, my, my father uh, retired from Union Carbide, and then he got something else afterwards, and so they had another little event, so I said, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, anything so. that I, uh, that you'd like to, uh, that I forgot to ask, or if you think I of anything else? I too much. <laughs> I, I really appreciate this. It's been very nice, and I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor.